Hi, Dr. Matthew Weiner from Commerce Michigan, here to talk to you about something I discuss a lot with my post-operative patients, which is exercise after bariatric surgery. So before we get started, let's talk about why exercise is important. And our, we have to abandon our traditional model of burning additional calories and taking in fewer calories as a, as a primary driver of weight loss. Instead, we have to look at what I refer to as your metabolic thermostat. Your metabolic thermostat is the idea that your brain and your gut work together to adjust your physiology to keep your weight at a certain number. And even if you're 100 pounds overweight, your brain and your gut are going to work together to prevent weight loss. And so what we see is that when we restrict the number of calories you take in or we increase the number of calories you burn through light cardiovascular exercise, we enter a starved state and our body compensates by increasing our hunger and decreasing our metabolism. And so rather than trying to fight against these physiologic changes, and as I tell my patients all the time, is you cannot fight your physiology, you have to work with it, you have to move it. So instead of fighting against it by trying to burn more and more calories, only having your body compensate by burning fewer and fewer calories during the time you're not exercising. We have to move our body set point. We have to convince our brain and our gut that we're not 300 pounds, that we're 280 pounds, that we're 250 pounds. We have to move that set point down to a lower number just as we've shown right here. And so the way to do that is to increase the amount of muscle mass you have and to use it vigorously rather than just to try to burn a lot of calories. So a common question I get from my patients is when can I start to exercise? And that's always a little bit difficult because first you have to define exercise. So let me first define exercise and physical activity. The simplest way I can describe it is physical activity does not require a change of clothes and exercise does. So light gardening, mowing your lawn, trimming the bushes, you don't need to change your clothes. But if you're going to dig a trench and plant some, and, and plant some um, flowers, that's going to require boots and gloves and a change of clothes. That suddenly becomes exercise. A walk in a shopping mall does not require a change in clothes. A jog outside does. And so when we're talking about physical activity, just getting your body moving, getting off the couch, going for a walk, doing a little bit of light housework, doing a little bit of light yard work, you can start that the day you get home from the hospital. In fact, I strongly encourage it. I like my patients up and moving. It helps prevent blood clots and it helps to, to, to start um, getting the weight loss going. So physical activity can start the day you get home from the hospital. When you start doing concerted exercise, that's, that's heavier lifting, that's more intense activity um, uh, where you're sweating and need to change your clothes, Generally, I recommend around three to six months before you try to start an exercise program. What I find is that younger people can start around three months. Older people tend to take up to six months to get there. So um, at around three to six months, whenever you start to feel like you're ready to get out there and get moving, and a few patients will be ready for it before then, but for most it's three to six months, then it's time to get started. So let's talk about your options. And I kind of break exercise down into one of three different types. The first is what I refer to as low to moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise. This is walking, elliptical, stationary bike. This is the idea of just burning calories, moving your body. Your heart rate gets up a little bit, but it's not dramatically elevated. And um, certainly you feel pretty good after you're done. Uh, but in essence, it's not all that strenuous. You can carry on a conversation with someone while you're performing this type of activity. The next level up is weight training. This is lifting weights. It's, that includes free weights, but it also includes the machines, but I'm certainly uh, a much bigger fan of the free weights and the dumbbell, dumbbells and the kettlebells. It all, but also, I would, I would want you to consider calisthenics, and I think they're even better. Push-ups and sit-ups and squats and lunges, and also things like yoga, which require some strength training. And I'll talk a little bit more about yoga later, but there's some really great things about yoga as a form of exercise. Um, a lot of other, other um, disciplines don't, don't allow. And then the final and kind of the highest level of exercise is interval training. These are the boot camp classes. This is the CrossFit. Um, this is what happens oftentimes when you work with a personal trainer. The way I would think about this is weightlifting 
that results in cardio activity. So you're, instead of just getting down and doing uh, 10 squats, you're doing 10 squats, and then you're doing 10 lunges, and then you're doing 10 push-ups, and then you're doing 10 jumping jacks, and by the time you finished all four of those activities, one after the other, you are out of breath and exhausted. Not just your muscles are exhausted, but your lungs and your heart are moving fast and really, really generating a lot of, um, of energy. And, and it's the idea of cardio fitness through weight training that I think is the ideal. So I don't really, in the perfect world, I don't break it up. It's not either cardio or strength training. It's both at the same time. So let's talk a little bit about low to moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise. When we're talking about driving weight loss, about causing weight loss, just getting on the treadmill, getting on the elliptical or the stationary bike is not going to be enough to cause the scale to move in the right direction. Many people will, will certainly uh, vouch for this, that they go to the gym, they're pretty disciplined about it, they're going four or five days a week. The, the, um, the treadmill tells them they're burning 400 calories during their workout, but the scale isn't moving and they're not losing weight. It's very different though when you talk about weight maintenance. And I think low to moderate cardiovascular exercise is very real, is, is very effective at maintaining weight loss. And that's a major, major issue for bariatric surgery patients. One thing that I do with my patients is I try to determine what level of exercise are you capable of? Almost everybody we can figure out a way to get some low to moderate cardiovascular exercise in. The weight training and the interval training is not for everybody, but we can always get some of this low, this type of exercise in. So when we're performing surgery, we're going to let the surgery do the weight loss work, and then we'll use this low uh, intensity exercise for help with weight maintenance. So even if you've got joint disease, you can get in the pool, you can even do a lot in the chair. Um, if you've got heart disease, we can still do things like this, go for, for a nice walk um, in order to, 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 to perform some exercise that's going to that's gonna allow you to, to stay at that weight longer and help secure that weight loss. Um, what I look for when patients, when I'm counseling patients, we select this as, as really the best way for them to start or in many, time, many situations, the only option for exercise is I, I want it to be enjoyable. If you go, and, and you go out for a walk and it's miserable for you and you just don't like it, well then that's not right for you. If you do a Zumba class, which is probably more along the lines of a moderate cardiovascular exercise, and sometimes they do even apply some interval training techniques in these classes. So there's, I think, a lot, um, a lot more effect from a Zumba class than just from a, a casual stroll or a stationary bike or an elliptical. But if you like the Zumba class, which a lot of people do, then that's the right thing for you. So I would, I would um, really encourage you to make sure you pick an exercise form that you like. And that goes for all forms that we'll do, but um, certainly here as well. And if possible, we should try to supplement your low to moderate cardiovascular exercise with a little bit of, of strength training. So maybe you, you go for walks or use the bike or the elliptical or get in the pool three times a, a week, and then two or three times a week you're doing some strength training. So when it comes to weight training, form and technique is critical and I encourage anybody who doesn't have formal training in weightlifting and has, isn't experienced to start with a trainer who is constantly correcting you and ensuring that you're using proper form. It's not about how much weight you lose, you lift, it's about how much, um, how perfect your technique is and so that is absolutely critical. And the reason it's critical is because injury is absolutely our, our most feared complication of exercise. And if we're going through all of this and we do something that we shouldn't be doing, if we're pushing our exercise beyond our capabilities and we become injured and then have to be sedentary for a month or two months, that's a very dangerous situation. Many of my patients point to a period of, of, of um, having to be sedentary after an injury as a major contributor to their weight gain. And we don't want to see that after surgery. We don't want to see weight regain because you're off your feet for three months because you tore a ligament in your ankle or your knee. And so working with a trainer, making sure your form is, is, is right on is absolutely critical. For that reason also, I don't want you to extort, ignore calisthenics like the push-ups and the, and the squats and the lunges and things along those lines because those movements tend to be much safer and much um, resi more resistant to injury than when you're, when you're lifting weights. 
And so for a lot of patients, that may be the best way for them to do it. Again, though, you still need to work with a trainer. You still need to make sure your form is proper on these. You can do a squat a wrong way um, and really hurt yourself. So you want to do it the right way. And, and I would recommend starting with calisthenics and then using weights or not using weights. You can get an amazing workout just using your own body weight. And when you walk in the gym, I don't want you to think, I want to get thin. I don't want you to think about burning calories. I want you to think about building muscle. You want to get strong. You want to develop bicep muscles. You want to be able to show them off. And, and that's the mentality I want you to walk into the gym with and focus on it. And I don't care if you're 75 years old, that's still the way you should look at your exercise routine. Another incredibly important part of, of weight training um, exercise is to use it for goal setting. What happens is in the first year you get great feedback because every time you get on the scale the numbers dropping. But in the second year you're not seeing that and it's oftentimes this is a period where you can start to slide back a little bit in terms of your nutritional habits and perhaps your exercise. So what I want you to do is start setting goals. Can you do 10 squats without stopping? That's a goal and if you reach that goal bam there's your positive feedback. There's the same thing that was happening in the first year and now you can use that to keep you going through, through year two and beyond and start setting goals for yourself in terms of what your body can do instead of what the scale reads because after the first year we typically don't see a lot of changes in the scale and if that feedback was what was keeping you motivated and we lose that we're in trouble. We got to find other things that keep you motivated. Also in the terms of calisthenics talking about yoga. Um, what yoga offers that a lot of others don't is it, is it really is not just about your body, it's about your mind. And what yoga teaches is to, to learn how to be uncomfortable in a certain position and to acknowledge that. And, and in developing that mental strength and that ability to kind of step outside your discomfort and recognize it for what it is rather than kind of sitting in it and struggling with it, that offers you that that some discipline that may carry into that the food choices you're making after your workout and the understanding well yes I may enjoy this type of food more but I can also eat this and feel sustained and nourished and be able to, to take that discipline that, that you're learning in your yoga practice into the rest of your life can add an extra um, an extra amount of, of, um, of effect of the exercise so I would encourage you to, to, to explore that. Um, and then interval training, it really is not for everyone. And this is, this is I, I definitely have a number of patients, probably about 10 to 20% of my patients are performing some type of interval training. But it's not something that I encourage for everyone. It can be very intense, it can be very intimidating and frustrating. Um, but, but it is, in my opinion, the best form of exercise. <laughs> but even if you're not going to the boot camp classes, um, there are principles in interval training which is high intensity intervals of exercise interspersed with periods of rest and typically a short period of time for say 20 or 30 minutes. You can implement this approach into whatever form of exercise you do. So a lot of patients will come and say, Dr. Weiner, I'm running a 5K and we're slapping high fives and, and get very excited about that and then, they'll say, and then if I do that I'm going to run a 10K. And then maybe a half marathon and who knows, Dr. Weiner, maybe I'll run a marathon one day. And I say, well, you know, that's, those are great goals and I don't want to discourage you from pursuing that. But here's how I would approach it. I'd try to, run, to, to get through a 5K. And then I'd say, can you run an entire 5K? That's over three miles. Can you get through a 5K in 35 minutes or less? Can you get through it in 30 minutes or less and use your time in the 5K? rather than the length of distance that you're traveling as your primary driver and what, what, what you're using to set your goals. And that's going to keep you focused on a little higher intensity exercise over a shorter period of time. And, and it also by running shorter periods of time a little bit faster, you're going to be more resistant to injury than when you go those, those long distances. Long distances, particularly when, you're, when you've got even 30, 40 extra pounds, they will wear on your knees, they will wear on your feet and you'll end up developing an injury and again injury is our number one enemy. So as far as a few final tips about exercise, the first thing is, is that exercise must be one of the best parts of your day. If you don't like your exercise routine then don't do it. Find something else and move on. 
The next is to think get strong and fast, not get thin. That's going to encourage you to, do, to, build, to build that muscle that's going to drive that thermostat setting lower. And when you walk into the gym, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how weak you think you are, I want you to walk in and say, today I'm going to work on making my body stronger. And, and body strength, muscle strength, is such a critical component to good health into your later years. And I want you to start to develop that now um, and, and make sure that, that, that you do that because that's going to drive weight loss the best. And also to use exercise for goal setting. After you reach that first year and the scale's not giving you the positive feedback, I want you to start using your workouts as the thing that you're able to say, hey, I can do 10 push-ups. And you walk around with your head held high and your shoulders back because you know that you can do 10 solid push-ups. And that is an accomplishment. And we have to shift it from I weigh 170 pounds or I weigh 160 pounds to I can do 10 push-ups. If you look at someone who's in great shape, they don't measure their fitness level based on what the scale says that day. If the scale says they're 140 or the scale says they're 145, that's not what determines how they're feeling about the condition of their body. It's what they can do in the gym. Could they, could they run that mile in, in under six minutes? Um, and, and whatever else that they're trying to do or accomplish in their life, it's about their performance, not their weight. And as you shift from someone who's overweight and, and morbidly obese to someone who's not anymore, we have to also shift the way your mind thinks. And it's not only about what the scale says, it's about what your body can do. And that's a critical, critical shift for you to make in your perspective. And also use exercise for stress relief. In my opinion, there's only two ways that you can actually relieve stress. There's drugs and alcohol, which we all know, although they may relieve stress for a short period of time, they certainly do not relieve it for the long run. Um, and all, that goes to, to also with prescription medications. But if you are in a bad mood or you are stressed or worried about something and then you exercise, I personally guarantee you, you will feel better about it. You will find a new perspective on the problem and you will take, be able to take a little bit more of a positive step. I'm not telling you it's going to solve all your problems. I'm just telling you it might change your perspective a little bit and that may be all you need to, to start moving in the right direction. So for those people who, you, who think about stress as a major contributor to their weight gain and, and stress as a contributor to their poor food choices, exercise is going to be a really, really powerful answer. And again, yoga is a great tool for that. And then finally, exercise offers a buffer against dietary indiscretions, meaning if you eat a certain way, you may or may not gain weight, but, but by exercising regularly, if you, if, you, if you come off the program a little bit, if you eat some foods that, don't, that aren't necessarily the best choices, but you're exercising, you may not gain weight. If you're not exercising, that may result in weight regain. So it, I'm not telling you that you can exercise and eat whatever you want. I'm telling you that life is tough and sticking to, our, to a perfect diet um, although it certainly is, an, is uh, an achievable goal and one many of my patients do, it's not always the real world. And what you may find is that you can kind of stray a little bit, have, go out for dinner with your friends one night a week, and by exercising that's not going to have any impact on your weight. If you're not exercising that might re uh, result in only one or two pounds a year being added, but again, that'll be 20 pounds over a decade. So it's going to help really maintain you at that absolutely low weight that, that you've um, been able to develop. Any more questions, you can check out my website at drmatthewiner.com or our Facebook page um, or our YouTube channel. And of course, you can read A Pound of Cure. It's available on Amazon. Thanks so much for your attention.